We have voting rights for everyone, people of color, minorities, everyone, people of age. There was even women who were high, heavily discriminated against up until the early 90s. Uh, other things were uh, discriminatory, discriminatory processes that were happening in public, uh, public um, forums, businesses. So a lot of the accolades that Dr. King brought about, or the SCLC came through and brought, have benefited us even to this day. I want to, uh, again, in my comments, I want to be very brief, but what I have to say is on the night before Dr. King died, he was giving a speech at the Mason Chapel, the Charles Mason Chapel in Memphis, Tennessee. And that speech was not about African American or Negro civil rights. It was about the plight of impoverished people around the world. Poor folks. Dr. King, in his eloquence and his speaking ability, he said, we are trapped in a tangled web of neutrality, meaning what affects one affects all. Are we still dealing with those types of problems today? Let me explain. I'm going to explain and I'm going to be brief. Guantanamo Bay is the, the topic or the theme of why we're here. Guantanamo Bay and how it should be closed down. Well, Dr. King advocated against the growing militarism uh, and talked about the problems with the Vietnam War. And historically, researchers have said that's why he was assassinated. That's why he was murdered. It wasn't about advocating for Negro civil rights. So when he began to speak out, the establishment, the government, the conspiracy, however you want to call it, basically did not like what he had to say. That's why he was murdered. Today, as we speak, we're dealing with a lot of the same problems. The growing military industrialism, the growing military industrial complex, aren't we? Yep. Don't we have those problems today? Yep. Didn't we see just down in Ferguson how mechanized infantry units and mechanized uh, tanks and, and infantry uh, battalions, the National Guard was just deployed against who? Did we see those people as black? Yes, they were black. But let's look at it a step further. Let's look at it as those people were impoverished people, those people were poor people. My community wants to say a lot of times that the issues that we deal with are because we are discriminated against because we're black. I say to a lot of the ministers who are under my tutelage, I say to a lot of the pastors and, and the folks in my congregation, in my coalitions, I say, Let's think further. Let's step further. Let's look beyond the color boundaries. Let's look at being a better human being. Because as we enter into a new world, a new day and age, isn't that where we're at? Aren't we dealing with a lot of the problems from democracy building that come from the United States wanting to spread its arm and its wing around the world? We call it nation building, aren't we? So, a story that I want to share with you. I actually was a, a military intelligence specialist in the Army, late 80s. Uh, I decided that uh, it was around the Persian Gulf War, and I was called to de be deployed overseas. Well, uh, 20, at the point in time, 20 years old, I, I went in when I was 18. I decided that because of what I believe, as a Christian, a person of faith, a young person, that I wasn't going to go over to the Gulf and fight and murder and kill anybody for the purposes of politics, because I looked at it as a, as a bureaucratic war. You might disagree. You might feel that it was wrong. You might feel that it was not the right thing to do. I struggle with that to this day, because my friends went there, some of them, and they died. They died in that war. I didn't. What happened to me was I became what we call a conscientious objector. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Okay. Conscientious objector, meaning that I was, I was 
released out of the military because of my religious principles. It can be your principles, it can be your beliefs, it can be whatever it is. It can be preferences like sexual preferences now, which is a huge topic of conversation, your sexual orientation, things of that nature. Mine was because I was a person of faith. So I was released, and, and a part of that process to be released is you have to go through a psychological evaluation, you have to go through so many different uh, steps. And the last step was to go into the commanding sergeant major of the whole battalion. My battalion was an infantry battalion. So this is the person who's over the whole post. And I began to prepare for this meeting. And, it, and as I was preparing for this meeting, Sergeant Major Rocky Hauser, very uh, heralded figure, had been in every war probably over the past 20 years from that point prior. And I was really, really ready to do a, a battle of the minds with him. I thought it was going to be a battle of mental jujitsu between me and him, <laughs> right? So as I was getting ready to pre and prepare to meet him and to tell him why I feel so strongly about what I felt and for him to assassinate my ideals, what I believed, I walked into his office and Rocky Hauser stood there, a very healthy figure, very impulsive, and for a 20-year-old, again, just um, something that was really quite the experience. So I sat down in a chair and I talked to him. I told him, well, I believe that as a person of faith, I was raised in Chicago. I, was, I had a Catholic parochial upbringing. Joseph Cardinal Bernadine was my uh, bishop in Chicago at that point in time, which if folks know, Chicago, Joseph Carter Bernadine was the presiding bishop. To make a long story short, I decided uh, to tell him about those experiences and he, I was prepared for him to assassinate me and to tell me, look, you know, you're trash, you need to get out of here, leave the country, because I had heard that so many times. He actually sat down with me and he said, I believe what you believe. I believe what you believe. He also explained to me that from his experience in the military, basically, had he did it all over again, he wouldn't be a soldier. He would have become something else. And then he explained to me why he felt that way. And from that experience, I gained so much respect for military service, for soldiers. I had friends who died in those wars. But coming back into today and now, this day and age, again, we have to be able to look at these challenges and the challenges that face our communities and for what it is. We have to look past the color line. I have advocated, I advocate for the Tamir Rice family, the 12 year old who was shot by the Cleveland police as a lead advocate. I advocated for a 12 year old who was the youngest person executed in US history, George Stinney Jr. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody, some people may be familiar with that case, but it was a 100 year old case from the East Coast. And the only way that we change that is historical. Again, the youngest person executed in U.S. history. Uh, I advocate for the Mike Brown family and work with them in their plight. Um, but what I am advocating for, again, is actually we have to be able to change the laws. Dr. King was very successful in his advocacy work because he changed the laws. He didn't look at it as a black struggle even though it was largely a black struggle, but if you ask, again, it was about what affects one affects the all. So our struggle today has to be to elevate the plight of poor people around the world. Our struggle today has to get beyond the color boundary. This black person that might be standing in front of you or that white person who I disagree with, the communication piece that we talked about, how 99% of the problems in our community can be resolved if we just learn how to talk to each other, Yes, it's so true. And it's the only thing that's really made change. It's the only thing. You asked a question. You said, why does Trump, correct me if I'm wrong, feel the way he feels? Why is he even allowed to have that platform, correct? That was the question. The question is because we've allowed him to have that platform. We've allowed the voices of all, everyone as a country, anyone who wants to speak can speak, anyone who wants to share, and there were people who believe that. But James Madison had a quote, which I want to leave you with. In the quote that James Madison, everyone knows who James Madison is, one of our presidents, historical presidents. James Madison had a quote. He said that 
there will always be fractions. Fractions meaning people who act outside of the public interest. There are always going to be people outside, outside of the public interest, but how do we deal with them? We band together, we stand together, and we communicate our process through. That's how we implement change, and it's the only thing that's ever worked. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. I appreciate being here, and I thank you for all the work that you've done, the advocacy, the work that you're putting in, and how we're implementing change together. And I would hope, again, over the course of the next several months, we are in a very historical and critical period in our country. And I would hope that every last human being, every last man, woman, child, elevates beyond the problems and can see clearer for what the issues really are. Because again, as we enter into a new world, a new day and age, there has to be change. And it has to start not with President Obama, not with Donald Trump. We're giving them too much credit if we look there. But it has to start with you and I. The conversations we have with our neighbors, the conversations we have with our living room, the conversation we have with our church organization, and that's how we implement change. 99% of the problems can be resolved if we just learn how to communicate. God bless you. Thank you.